Hi, I uh, welcome to another uh, webinar from the Helsinki Photo Festival. Uh, my name is Kurt Richter. Uh, tonight we have three uh, photojournalists. And um, just briefly about the uh, festival, um, it goes on to the end of September. There are a number of exhibitions around the city, indoors and outdoors. Uh, other events and talks uh, are still coming up. Uh, take a look at the website, please, and uh, you know, join in and uh, take a look at the shows. Uh, the uh, format for the talks uh, are 10 minutes where the photographers present their work and uh, tell us something about them, uh, why they, you know, what, what the work was. You know, roughly speaking, I, I won't introduce people, I'll let them do that for themselves. And then we'll have about five minutes of some question and answers. Um, so without further uh, preamble, uh, the, our first two photographers uh, work together. It's Thomas Victor and Felix Alder. Uh, welcome, guys. Can you hear us? Yeah, yeah, we hear you. Yeah. Hello. The ball's in your court. Catch you in 10 minutes. Cool, thanks. So yeah, we are uh, Felix Adler and Thomas Victor. We are both uh, documentary photographers, live in Leipzig in Germany. And um, the series, which is exhibited on the Helsinki Photo Festival is called Flatten the Curve. And we, uh, we basically documented the COVID-19 pandemic um, yeah, around us. So in, in the early 2020, when when it was clear that, um, that there will be a pandemic uh, in Germany or that the virus will come here, we both of us, we sit together and decided to uh, documentate this together. We, we didn't have done this uh, before. So it was the first new experience for us to work as a photographic couple. And yeah, we, we basically just went out and, and looked what, what happened in the streets or yeah, the first thing we photographed, um, you see on the left side, was in a hospital. Uh, there was no no COVID case in Leipzig so far, but uh, the hospitals already prepared themselves. You see they're a nurse in a testing center. They just waited for the first patients to come to be tested. And yeah. And on the right side, you see, you see a supermarket, obviously. Um, they prepared themselves very quickly or very fast um, with this protection child. Hey, sorry to interrupt, but yeah. we, we want to see the pictures uh, full screen. If you look at the bottom underneath the, um, the image you're showing, I believe yeah. there's one that you click that says hide. And I mean, that's for you to hide so we, um, so we can see the image full screen. Uh, yeah, but we have a problem because we don't see the cursor, so we... Oh. On, uh, on height. Well, I can't, I'm, I'm afraid I can't see it, but I was just, we wanted to be able to see the features you yeah, know, yeah, as large yeah. as possible. Uh, Go ahead. Well, oh shit, sorry. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> then we went to kaleidoscope. <laughs> yeah. sorry, I shouldn't it? have said anything. I should have just let it be. Yeah, um, maybe like this. Somebody, let's get your pictures back and we can get rid of me. No, yeah. no, it doesn't work now. Well, do you see uh, we're back to where we was. We just we need to get rid of me, you know, looking at you, you know, presenting. But, um, but you see the is that right? right? Yeah, no, we, I'm sorry. I guess, uh, I, yeah, we're all set. We're all set. What do you see now? Um, well, now at the moment, I'm seeing just you two and me, but. Okay, okay, okay wait. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Full screen. Oh, sorry. Push the uh, full screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait. Got it. Uh, pop. Zip. Yeah, I think it doesn't work better than this. Is it okay? Is that good, Laura? 
Do, do you see the pictures now? Oh yeah, yeah, no, I, I it's fine. Okay, cool. So yeah. then the, uh, the picture on the left side, when we heard about a priest who did his Easter service um, just online, there was no audience allowed in, uh, in the church. And we went there. Uh, yeah, you see this one on the right side, the airplane. Uh, we, we did this one because yeah, all the shops have been closed. Everything was just, you can order online. People ordered their toothpaste or their cheese online. And uh, this is the airplane from, from DHL. And nearby our city, there's a big DHL hub. So this was our answer on the online market. Yeah, and then, you know, the, uh, on the left side, you see some, um, some guys. They, they were cleaning the uh, uh, tramways. And before the pandemic, there uh, used to be um, controllers and the, they were checking the tickets of the passengers. And during the pandemic, they had to, to clean the, uh, uh, the trains. It uh, was quite funny to uh, get this information. <laughs> and on the right side, you have a, um, a friend of mine. Uh, he's, uh, he's a, a programmer, IT guy. And uh, he, with the first lockdown, he started to work from, uh, from home. Like fluently, and yeah, uh, for him it was quite hard because he did, he was not able to go to work and he didn't have a, 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 a car, couldn't divide between uh, free time and uh, work time. Yeah, and yeah, and the, the pictures you have seen now are might be of the first two weeks of our work, and then we started to think about like what is it what we are doing there, what are we documenting, and it figured out that. Uh, we are documenting the ways people find around the problems. So there was the pandemic who, who put the people to be just at home and they can move and everybody had the same problems, but uh, step by step, their solutions came up. So in this picture, you see a home for elderly people. The old woman sitting there is living there. And in this home, uh, relatives, uh, weren't allowed to to visit their their grandmas and grandpas, but this home for elderly people, they find a solution. They uh, build a space at the fence where the people who live there can meet their relatives. And so, on the fence, you could see a lot of people sitting there. And on the other side of the fence, there are, have been their daughters and sons. And so, to talk to them, it was quite a yeah romantic situation, maybe. Yeah. But also people found uh, other ways to, like, uh, parties where also weren't, there were, weren't any parties possible anymore. And, um, but, uh, yeah, the people found a way to celebrate uh, anyway. And it was, this picture shows a, a car party at an uh, abandoned uh, air, uh, airport, I think. Huh? Yeah. <clears throat> Actually, the, one of the girls in the car celebrate her 19th birthday, you see on the numbers in the balloon. Then also we like um, yeah most uh, uh, most schools switched to homeschooling, but uh, this picture shows uh, uh, the uh, how to say uh, the class the last class of the uh, before graduate oh, the gradu graduating class, and um, they had a uh, uh, face to face uh, um, teaching in a uh, yeah, sports hall gym gym yeah. Um, also, during our uh, 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 survey about Corona, um, uh, we found some objects that were kind of related to, to the pandemic, and we like we started to take stills of these uh, objects. So we see this a protection shield on the left side. In the middle, it's a, a door handle uh, to open the door with your elbow and not with a hand. And then, yeah, then you have this strange. Uh, uh, snow globe uh, on the right side uh, with a um, toilet paper inside um, yeah we found it interesting yeah and now yeah then we uh, looked at our friends what uh, they are doing like what what the cultural life uh, here is doing and on the left side you see a tattoo artist who is he wasn't allowed to work, but he he did it. He did it in his private space, or it's it's his studio, not his private space. But the guy he's tattooing is a friend, 
And on the right side, these are friends who are doing a home party with international friends. Yeah, it all happened indoors and people find, found their ways to, to do what they like to do. And they, um, this is another thing. Uh, this is a family. You don't see all of them. It's, uh, there are 10 people living in a 120 square meter flat. And one of them had uh, the virus. And so all of them had to stay in quarantine for two weeks. And yeah, we visited them. We visited them later to, yeah, to ask how it was to be in quarantine on such a small flat with such a lot of people. And this situation just came up. Uh, we, yeah, the parents have been cool with their kids. I think they, they played a lot, how you see. Yeah, then also the, you have this uh, protest uh, aspect on Corona. Uh, I don't know what, how it was in other countries, but in Germany um, there were this uh, these anti-Corona uh, demonstrations uh, at the end of year last year all over the, the, the country. And yeah, this is one of the biggest uh, in Leipzig, the town where we're living. Yeah. And then the whole series was uh, we, we published with the newspaper Die Zeit and they asked us to documentate as the worst uh, side of the COVID pandemic. It was in autumn 2020 when we accompanied some morticians. Like over here, you see two of them uh, taking a, a, a person who died from COVID-19 from the hospital. And uh, then we went to a uh, crematation center, I think is the right word for it. They have been really, yeah, they had too much work. They work day and night and yeah, we, we made this picture or we have been, we have been assigned to make this picture to show the people here how, how it is. Because there have been quite a lot who, who didn't believe in the COVID-19 virus. But again, there was a, there was a solution. Uh, over here, you see the vaccination transport again at the DHL hub in Leipzig. Uh, we had an appointment there, and we arrived there. But the uh, the truck with the with the vaccine he arrived late, and so we waited and waited. And then when the truck arrived, it was like yeah, it looked like like a lot of ants who just came and bring all the vaccine to the next airplane, which carries into the whole world. There's a picture of a vaccination center. I think most of us, or I, I have been really, um, yeah, I don't know how to say. Impressed? Yeah, I was impressed how well organized they have been. There have been a lot of soldiers working. Yeah, and then or what we're doing right now is to um, documentate the the long COVID. Um, we are still, it's still an ongoing project for us. Here you see on the left side um, a guy in a machine which is uh, testing his lungs. And on the right side you see a man who was quite sportive uh, before he got COVID and uh, then he had a long way to train back. But uh, we didn't want to finish with, with these uh, kind of sad pictures. So our last one is uh, just a little one we found by the street. It's a command some graffiti artist uh, did for all of us. Thanks. Okay. Do you hear us? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. No, I, I can hear you. Um, hopefully, you can hear me. Yeah. Um, really. Yeah. yeah. There we go. Great. Well, I, I'm. I'm. It's unusual that you have two photographers, you know, signing off on the on the same images. Tell us something about how you worked. I mean, I presume you did. You worked together. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, some. You mean uh, how we decided to take the uh, who's who's taking the pictures? No, I mean literally, you're working together. I mean, setting up the photograph. I I, I was going to ask you about the lighting and in, in, in my next question, but I mean, the two of you aren't working together. I mean, separately, and then editing your independent pictures. Um, you know, once you look at them all you're actually going to locations and shooting uh, yeah, uh, together. Like, like, yeah, like most of the pictures we did together. And right. then on location, um, mostly we were before we were talking about how to photograph it, what's interesting, and uh, then sometimes you just flip the coin who, who's, uh, who took the camera uh, to take the picture. 
So yeah, right. it's like, but I mean, mostly it comes up like this: that one of us found th something interesting we want to photograph, and then, then like Felix said, we we discussed about, and sometimes during the shooting we we just uh, changed the photographic position and the lighting position. So, so it was quite a nice flow. Yeah. All right. I think that's the best experience we got from this uh, the work on this series uh, that uh, it's possible to work together as a photo uh, like a photographic team. It's unusual. I mean, had you done any projects together before? No, no, no. Have no. you ever worked together? But you're both independently photographers. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah we, we never did before, but actually. We're doing mostly the same stuff. So, <laughs> <laughs> so two heads are better than one. But yeah. Be, yeah. yeah. Well, the other thing I'm interested about, I mean, you're, you're uh, setting up fairly elaborate lighting. Um, I mean, there is natural light, but it seems to be the, the dominant lights, the brightest lights are ones that you are, are artificial. I, I mean, I, I presume they're strobes, but I mean, that's not really important. But how much are you then uh, coordinating with your subjects? I mean, in terms of not arranging them, but you know, constructing the photograph, um, arranging the people. Mostly, mostly we start. We just step into the situation. Sometimes we ask before. Sometimes we just have been there, mm -hmm. and sometimes we ask if they can hold on for a minute or. All right. Or um, the family you have seen, we 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 have been there after the quarantine, so it was kind of staged. But we just asked to be in the flat at the right. time, and then we hang out with them. So we didn't stage it. We yeah, they did just. I didn't uh, mean the stage. Year. Staged is, but I mean that's in English that that's that has negative connotations, and I didn't mean it that way at all. I meant yeah. that. Yeah, there is a dialogue between you and your subject matter as you're working, is there not? Yeah. Yeah, sure. There is mostly, yeah. not, not always, not on the demonstration and not in the elderly home. Yeah. And so on. Yeah, 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 and I mean, I think it's self evident where it is and, and to, to yeah. what extent, usually in the photograph. Yeah. 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 But if you work with flesh, I don't think you can be like the fly on the wall. That's <laughs> not possible. No, no. That, and, and that tends to be, particularly if we're talking about. Uh, you know, documentary photography. That's usually what people think that that you are a uh, a fly on the wall. You know that people are not even. You know, you try not to be. Your presence is not supposed to be uh, even noticed. Clearly, that's that. You know, there's a lot more going on with the way the two of you are working together. Do you find that that changes the context of it being documentary for, uh, photography? You mean the the uh, use of artificial light and the? Well, I mean that you are involving yourself in the scene. You know what the scene I mean, but you know what you're photographing. I mean the people we photograph. If they if we ask them before, they they have this second to to think about how they <laughs> want to be photographed. So right. yeah, it, it it changed the game a bit. Oh um, sure, yeah, I mean as I said, it's not it's not a judgment. I'm just curious. Yeah, yeah. I think we are not the first ones who we are doing so. It's a, it's kind of a movement to in in the in the documentary photography that that you try to try, try to find a certain. That is also. Uh, yeah. Okay. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> way how you want to tell a story if you if you compose the picture in. In, in a minimum of range. Yeah, I, I mean, sure. I just hadn't noticed it before in something like this, where it's it's very specifically about a uh, you know uh, a, a a news topic. I mean, this is you know this is a world you know uh, uh, crisis, and um, it, it, this is not the kind of photographs you'd see in a newspaper. You know, I mean, it is. I think it's interesting. I think it's great. Um, uh, you know, a lot of times the work that you do see is, you know, photojournalism. Um, you know, it, they, it's just somebody standing back with a long lens. Um, you know, it, it's not very engaging. You clearly are very engaged with the with the scenes. Um, 
And then, I mean, for instance, did that the 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 shots, particularly the the one of the morgue where you had all the coffins inside the uh, uh, um, mortuary, um, that was also lit, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Yeah, I mean, that must have been a little creepy. I mean, that, yeah. Yeah, but it was a creepy situation as well. This was, I mean, this actually, this picture did uh, Felix alone because I've been at the other side of with the morticians in the hospital. Right. Yeah, yeah actually, like, the, I, I mean, I, I was there for the for the site, uh, and I spent like three days there. And uh, at the first day, at the beginning, it was super strange to have, to to be surrounded by all these covens and uh, to know, uh, yeah, everywhere. I to know they weren't empty. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I think yeah. at, at the third day, it, it was like kind of normal. <laughs> but, wow. but, but, but for you, I think it's quite a. It's quite I mean, a, not, not 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 the situation that you have so many like that so many people die on Corona, but um, like just the situation to be surrounded by these uh, by deaths, like. Uh, yeah. yeah, but it's it's uh, part of the work to to bring all these feelings you have when you are there in one picture for people who are looking at one picture. I mean, it's. I think the the creepy thing this picture has is. is quite real. Well, it's also that there's so many of the coffins were literally stacked on top of each other. You know, yeah. it's not this visual sort of sacred, reverent, you know, yeah. image as you think of, you know, corpses, someone, you know, dead body being handled in. Well, I mean, it's a, it was a, it's a really great series and I guess you're going to continue with it, aren't you? We're doing right now, yeah. Yeah. Any end in sight? I mean, are you just leaving it open? I mean, it, there's no end in sight with the pandemic, as far as I can see. That's it. Uh, yeah. that, hopefully, there will be an end. So, yeah, uh, I'm, I, I was hoping it would be seeing light at the end of the tunnel by now, but um, with the variants, that's not happening. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think you'd stay in Leipzig? I mean, are, are you? Do you see it expanding into other other areas, some other um, part of Germany or mm -hmm. Europe? We, yeah, we have been to more parts in Germany. We're just staying in Leipzig. And I mean, most of the experiences with COVID are everywhere the same. Like in, in Hamburg or in Berlin, they, they experienced the same problems with COVID. So wow. we, yeah, we, we can photograph a lot of this stuff here, but some not. For some stuff, we traveled around. Um, well, thank you. I mean, at the end, we hope to get everybody back together. And... Um, you know, then we can have a, a group chat. Uh, but that was great. Thank you, Thomas and Felix. We'll see you in a bit. Okay. Bye. Hi. How are you? I'm good, thank you. <laughs> great. Well, you know the format. It's 10 minutes to show and then five minutes to talk and questions. Yeah. Uh, welcome to the program, Bertha. Hi, hi. Uh, so I can always start now. Yeah, no, I mean, it, 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 it's over to you. I'll see you in a little bit. Okay, see you. So, uh, hello, my name is Bertha, and I'm a photographer based in Hong Kong. Um, today, I'm going to share about my project. Uh, it's called For Actually, the Earth Had Snow to begin with. Uh, it is a uh, photo theories that document um, um, Hong Kong anti-government protests in 2019. And before talking about my, uh, taking you, you over my pictures, I would like to share a little bit about my background and also um, a little bit history about China and Hong Kong so that you can have a more understanding about my the concept of my project. So uh, my photography interests, is I like to explore the concept of identity especially focusing on um, hong kong identity and i was born and raised in hong kong and i grew up in the british colonial and post-colonial period and hong kong sent over to china in 1997 and i witnessed all the changes and uh, politically socially um, during this tra transition because china and hong kong has a different uh, political and economic system, and Hong Kong is considered as more liberal, while China is the other way around. And um, China is um, is 
under like a um, communist economy and Hong Kong is running in a capitalist way. And uh, the contradiction and the hostility um, intensify over the past 10 years um, because there are more interactions between Hong Kong and China. And uh, whenever people ask us, like, where are you from? We are, we would say that, like, we are from Hong Kong. Uh, we seldom say that, like, we are uh, from China. So uh, it's raised my um, uh, curi curiosity to see that, like, why uh, we are so proud of us as a Hong Konger and what are the elements that uh, constitute as a Hong Konger. And talking about the 2019 anti-government protests in Hong Kong, so it is um, basically, it's, uh, the Hong Kong government tried to introduce um, an extradition bill that can transfer um, uh, uh, some uh, people who commit crime overseas um, to somewhere else to put on trial. And um, uh, because of a murder case in Taiwan, so a Hong Kong guy, he murdered his girlfriend in Taiwan, but because there's no extradition agreement between China and uh, Hong Kong and Taiwan. So the government introduced the bill, um, the extradition bill. But this bill doesn't only um, uh, in, include Taiwan, but also Macau and, and mainland China. And because of the um, judicial system between Hong Kong and uh, China are quite different. So um, there's a chance that if people commit crime in Hong Kong, they can be extra, um, they're being sent back to uh, China to put on trial wish we believe that um, uh, people in Laos will not be fairly treated. So uh, people at that time in, during the summer, they went on the street to protest, to um, request the government to withdraw the bill and the government refused. So uh, the protest kind of um, intensified and continues. And, and they, it also escalated into more violence, especially between uh, protesters and, and police. And the uh, Protests continue for like seven months and until early 2020 because of COVID-19, the protests sort of like died down. Um, during the protests, I work as a freelance news producer for Al Jazeera. So I spend um, most of the time running in the street with my safety gears and helmets and and often, um, often with my camera because I want to document what's going on in Hong Kong. But it was quite tough and a hostile environment because uh, the peaceful protests often result in like a violent one. Police will fire tear gas, uh, rubber bullet, and sometimes live rounds. So I have to ensure uh, the safety of the crew and myself. Uh, but at the same time, I want to document what, uh, the ongoings here. And at the same time, it was quite tough because protesters are often quite um, sensitive to the camera because they are afraid some um, pro-government people, they will take some headshots of them and report to the police. So um, you can see that in, in many news photos, like most of the protesters, they're covered with, uh, with the Google, uh, Google and, and, and face masks. And, uh, but when they know that I'm a journalist, so they are quite friendly to, to me. So it is easier, a bit easier for me to take pictures. Uh, but after the protest, so uh, I started this project um, in March 2020. So I, I at the beginning, I didn't um, want to uh, form start a project on it because I found it is quite a um, traumatic experience for me because uh, I have been suppressing my feelings uh, throughout the uh, the protests because as a journalist, like you have to stay neutral, and and I try to stay away from news and and uh, watch videos of of the protests. Uh, but but when I come down and think about it, like I think it is um, necessary for me to uh, to tell the other side of the story, like. Um, on the news, like we saw a lot of like violence and conflicts, but but through this project, I want to show some um, elements that is untold. Like I saw the beauty of uh, Hong Kong people and the um, characteristics of a Hong Konger. So. On some subtle element also uh, the characteristics of uh, Hong Kong identity and but at the same time I want to tell uh, what's going on that 
about the process as well. And frankly, it takes me some courage to uh, go through the uh, photos again. And it takes me some time as well because uh, it's like a seven month uh, photos. So, <laughs> so I have to go through, like take the uh, best shots uh, of them. Brother, uh, and, forgive me for brother. Forgive me for interrupting, but let, let's see some of the work. Let's let let's see the, um, yeah, yeah. You know, the, the yeah, pictures. So, yeah, I, I won't interrupt you again. Yeah. So so this is the first picture. So uh, it's kind of like a sense of humor because this is a advertisement of a Kuji, and the uh, uh, models like cover have her eyes cover because uh, one of the uh, first aid fallen uh, tried to volunteer in the process, but her eyes got shot. By the rubber, rubber, uh, rubber bullet, so the protests uh, try uh, protesters they whenever they see the eyes they will cover it with, um, with, a, with a, some stickers on it, and and the other thing I saw about is um, about Hong Kong people is the solidarity. So you can see like people are trying to help each other even though they don't know, uh, but because of the similar political stance, uh, this protest somehow connect many Hong Kong people. And, um, but at the same time, there are many sad moments. So this is uh, pictures at, at a car park so we, uh, with some flowers and candles. So one of the young protesters, he fell off from a car park and, and he passed away um, a weeks later. So people uh, lost thousands of people, like try to um, send flowers and, and blessing to him, but unfortunately he passed away. And this also happened to some uh, like, some protesters who commit suicide. So, so like you can see the solidarity and some sadness. And um, this is the pictures of police uh, firing tear gas. So, so uh, the protests brought some unity, but at the same time, it caused some uh, divisions, especially between people and the police. Uh, people become very hostile to police until um, today. And um, the, because they they accuse police to um, to uh, for their brutality towards the protesters, uh, I try not to show the pictures of, of of police like beating people, but I want to show some uh, some subtle element instead. And um, this is the pictures of so showing the unity as well. Um, the people trying to uh, throw some. Uh, uh, umbrellas and waters to help the frontline protesters. And uh, this is the very beginning of um, the the process as well. Uh, so this is a picture that's taken from uh, a playground. So I remember that they uh, was a uh, police tried to fire tear gas towards one young protesters who tried to escape from a university campus, and. The onlookers around me, they were screaming and and ple pleading the police not to shoot the protesters. So it's kind of like helpless at that time. You feel like this, um, the despair, you can feel that despair. Uh, but at the same time, it's like Hong Kong people are very resilient, just like this umbrella who um, trapped into the gap. Like even though that is trapped, but it's still like very um, rebellious uh, resilience uh, towards um, towards what's happening in Hong Kong. Uh, so this is a picture of a high school student forming human chain. So it's quite funny because this uh, there are two school um, uh, students from two elite school in Hong Kong. So they are competitors all the time. But uh, at this moment, they they held in hands, join hands together. So um, just as what I said, uh, the uh, protests connect many Hong Kong people. So this is uh, uh, umbrella hatch. So um, protesters they don't have any many weapons, just like police. They have tear gas and powerful weapons, but uh, they use the most simple way: uh, umbrella to form a hatch as a as a sh uh, shield to uh, defend police. And there's a famous uh, slogan in the protest as uh, that is be water, uh, which means that um, just go with the flow and be fluid. And it also shows the how smart Hong Kong people are. And yeah. And the last one is a picture that um, taken 
after the police firing tear gas. Uh, I remember I was hiding in a building at that time when police fired tear gas to disperse the protesters. Uh, when I walk out and I saw these two protesters came back and asked the protesters to come back um, to fight again. And, and you can see that like the perseverance of Hong Kong um, people and also the hope that they have. And even until now, like um, we have overcome 2020 COVID and 2021, uh, many Hong Kong people are leaving because of the national security law. They, uh, they leave Hong Kong and many people went exile or, or fled away Hong Kong. Uh, but for, so for my, my project, the title is called For Actually the Earth Had No Road to Begin With. It is a quote from a book of a Chinese author. And the second sentence of this quote is, uh, but, when, uh, but, but when many pass one way, a road is made. So my project is, um, well, I want to dedicate this project to um, Hong Kong people who uh, fight for their belief and, and fight for what they build, uh, fight for their values. So yes, this is the end, thank you. Um, well, thank you very much, uh, Bertha. Uh, well, this is obviously um, more in the traditional vein of uh, photojournalism or documentary photographer than um, Thomas and Felix. Um, get, uh, tell us more about the, your background as a photographer. I mean, um, how did you begin? I mean, what, what, can you tell us what photo photographers you liked and wanted to emulate? Um, what well, drew you to photo journalism? Yeah, so before 2019, I, I, I'm kind of like a, a street photographer. I want to capture all the moments in Hong Kong because like I feel the city has been has changed a lot. Like many um, historical buildings, they vanish because of urban redevelopment. And mm -hmm. you can feel the atmosphere um, over the years has changed a lot. So I want to document like what's going on in Hong Kong. But uh, after 2019, uh, I, because of the protests, I, I document all the happenings in Hong Kong and I share it on social media. And and, and my friend said that, well, um, uh, thank you for uh, recording what is happening in Hong Kong. So so I at that time, I really want to think about, like maybe I should work as a photojournalist to like, document to tell the world what's going on in Hong Kong. So um, so this is like my my journey to photography, <laughs> like from a street right. photographer and to like a photo, more news uh, photojournalist. Yes. Well, in your case, and the, the media is not necessarily the message. I mean, it, it you are using photography to document the social, uh, you know, revolution that um, uh, the government would just assume is not uh, shared with the rest of the world um, or with yeah. each other. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's. I mean, it just speaks to the you know the different ways that you can think of photography. I mean, it. Um, it does have that function, you know, that it is a way mm -hmm. to uh, enlighten people about what's going on. I mean, for instance, you know, politicians are terrified often of having an event photographed. Uh, if people can see the horror, um, it, it's hard. It, it has a much greater impact on the general public if then they just, you know, hear about it or read about it. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I mean, yes, please go on. Yeah, I I think that like photography is a universal language that you don't have to. Uh, it's a common language that everyone can understand. It's easy. Right. It's eye catching. It's like when you look at the picture, you know what's the story about. And and so I think it's really powerful to let the world to know what's going on. Like even though in your I'm in Hong Kong, I know what's going on now in in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and and the. And the pictures online like strike me. So I believe that, that those pictures back in 2019 um, uh, speak the story and, and let many people in the rest of the world knows what's going on in Hong Kong. 
Oh, uh, well, they do. I mean, after, you know, after the, um, starting when the protests began, it was, it, it really dominated the international news. Um, and it was, they were, you know, quite detailed daily reports. Um, yeah. You know, that's become less so just with other events taking over, um, you know, the, yeah. the, the news cycle. Um, but it's, um, I, I'm curious, you're, you are photographing, you know, to the events on the street. Um, are there any behind the scene uh, events, uh, meetings? Uh, I mean, are, you know, are there other areas to the, to the revolution? I mean, it really is a revolution at this point that you are interested in documenting. Uh, you mean besides news or? Oh, yeah, I mean, you're, uh, what, 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 you're at the front line, but sure, there's got to be a lot of communications, there are class clandestine meetings. Uh, certainly the government has, has got a, uh, probably a, a constant present on the street um, to let people know that, you know, they're being watched. It seems like the events you're, you're focusing on are, are the protests. Is that, is that right? Yeah, uh, at that time, yes. Because, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, at that time, yes. Yeah, uh -huh. but, but now uh, I'm focusing more on the daily lives of Hong Kong people because uh, no more protests these days in Hong Kong. Right. Uh, like, I, I want to take the pictures of the norm normality of of these days, the quiet and very safe Hong Kong, and and kind of showing some like contradictions. Yeah, this is what I'm I'm trying to focus now. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, thank you. It, it's you know it's very powerful work, and it's um, you know it's just one of the many crisis centers around the world at the moment. Um, but you know, I'm glad you're there to to record it. Thank you. Sure. Um, well, uh, I, let's um, move on then to, um, or are you going to take a little another break, Laura? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. That was quick. I thought we had a little bit more of an uh, uh, interlude there. Hi, how are you? Am I pronouncing it right? Uh, you are? Well, yeah, can you, can you hear me? Program. Welcome to the program. Hello, Kurt. Uh, thank yeah. you for, for giving me the chance to join you tonight. Uh, it's uh, my pleasure. Uh, and I'm really happy that I can share uh, part of my work uh, with uh, your audience. Please go ahead. I'll, I'll depart now and catch you in about 10 minutes. Okay, so let's start. Yeah, take over. It's your screen. It's your show now. Okay. So my project is called Starting Over from the Donbass to Chernobyl. And uh, it's a story which uh, I did back in 2019. And it was uh, it is a result of the war in Eastern Ukraine. Over a million displaced people starting looking for a new home so yeah some 1.5 million internally displaced persons have fled from eastern ukraine to other parts of the country since the outbreak of the war because the war has taken away not only their homes and jobs but also their future alexei for example uh, used to have a big farm in eastern part of ukraine and uh, because of the war he had to leave his home but the question was for him okay where can i continue my life and he decided to go in a place which for i can say most of the people is a no-go area and this is uh, the villages around the chernobyl exclusion zone so when i decided to go there together with a journalist and make the story I was afraid, to be honest, because, uh, of course, radiation, Chernobyl, everybody knows more or less what's going on there. But on the other side, some people took a decision to start their life from the beginning. So when I met Ale Alexei, he's over 50, and he found there some fields, and his idea is to, to start an 
and cultivating and growing uh, different plants so to give life also to this place and uh, what i really liked about him and the story is uh, the resilience so we know like in some places in chernobyl the life somehow stopped and people had to evacuate their homes and then it's a catastrophe but um, new life is coming after 30 years i found this kind of houses that they left 30 years ago and then this new one so this girl is the daughter of, of alexei his wife and his other daughter and they came with the will to uh, change something in their lives but also for the locals because you know, it was very interesting being there i realized that the locals who stayed there um they have something similar with Alexei and his family. There are two catastrophes and two fates. Those who remained, who lost everything then, and now lead it a shadowy existence, and the newcomers who are left on their own when they start afresh. People with the same story that brings together. Although they're among the victims of the two greatest disasters Ukraine has experienced since its inception, they are now among the weakest it is almost a bit cynical that they should live together. So this is a portrait of Alexei. Um, I try uh, because I choose the story that I have to that I want to do. It was not an assignment, and for me it was important to somehow go close to the story, to deep, to to excuse me, to dive deep in the story and and to feel what's going on there um so it was important to see his daily life his family his work and for him was important he told me that uh, going to the church is a very old church in a village somewhere i don't remember the name to be honest um that gives him power he said at the beginning, I thought the most important thing is my job and my family. But during the war, I, I realized that the most important thing is life on itself. And uh, so he found a release for his soul to go on this church alone. Uh, he has the key and everything. And, you know, to, to be thankful that he's still alive. Mm. These are some pictures from walls. And then in another village in Dityaki, it's it's uh, like, I can say, two kilometers from the exclusive zone of Chernobyl. I found uh, Roma and Vadim. Uh, so they are also from the east part of Ukraine. So what they are doing to survive, they are taking metal, from garbages, you know, and they are smelting it, they're burning it, so, and they're doing metal out of it, so which they can sell it. They found this place, they bought it, as far as I can remember, like for two or 300 euros, I'm not sure. And it was completely abandoned place. And with this few money that I had, they try to make something out of it. Yeah, so this is the owner, and he used to be a businessman in, in uh, Eastern part of Ukraine, and so he had the knowledge uh, of how to, to do something. But what really impressed me was his, his power and his will to start again. He's 50 years old, and I think at this age is quite difficult to start your life from the beginning. Uh, so yeah, this is uh, when they put, uh, when they burn the metal, and for me it was quite quite difficult to to breath to breathe uh, therein, <laughs> but they do it every day. So this is the forest around the place. 
so this is another family that I had a few hours to, to bring with them, to be honest. It's quite far away from, from the place. Uh, but those villages actually are, uh, the villages where like Saint Roma started again after the war are among those over which the wind carried the radioactive cloud in the days after the disaster. So this is where the fields, schools and roads are where the rain falls, making the region uneconomical to this day. But for those, let's say, uh, uh, migrants, because it's a story of migration in Ukraine, um, it was just a solution to go in a place where life is quite cheap. Um, so, yeah, this is... Uh, more or less uh, the story that uh, I did in, in Ukraine. And for me, the message is the resilience. So it doesn't matter. Um, it doesn't really matter what happens in, in life, difficulties. It's important to find a way to get out and to start again. It's not easy, but it's, it is possible, yes. Well, it, I mean, it, when you say that, I mean, um, I, um, I don't know how old you are, but I, I don't know if you remember the uh, riots in Los Angeles is over 25 years ago. And um, uh, I was talking to my father about it and he, his answer to it was very simple. He said, you can, people can endure almost anything but you, you have to give them hope and, and people will look for hope. And I think that's what your photographs do so beautifully and, and a very personal touch to them as well. Um, no, I mean, it, <laughs> you know, you, you have to have a, you, you know, people can't, you, you can endure anything as long as there's hope that you can live and, and you know, that there's possibility for things to get better. Um, I think that's why the riots in Los Angeles were so brutal. Um, you know, they, that people just didn't see that there was, you know, for being black in Los Angeles, it was hopeless. Um, well, it, it's, tell us more about your background then. I mean, I know a little bit, but, you know, share it with the audience. I mean, this is something that you did on your own, separate from your other work. So tell us a little yeah, bit about well, your background and how you came to, to decide to do this project. Mm -hmm. Well, um, to start uh, with my background, uh, it's important to say that I was born in Albania. When I was six, we migrated to Greece. And after I finished my study in Greece, I migrated into Germany. So if there is something that I know quite, quite good is migration. So of course, I feel very close to these kind of stories because it's like I see my own story or my own family. So Alexei could have been my father, uh, you know? Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm close to these stories. That's why I think I can, I, I have also, which is very important for every photographer, um, the sensitivity and the empathy of uh, what you see. Uh, it's not only the photographic, you know, the picture must be like this and that. Yes, it is important, but on the same time, it's important to see if if pictures that are on your on, on the way um, are related to emotions or to memories. And to be honest, uh, when I photograph, uh, I, I have memories in my mind and I see them again in front of me. And there is where I... Uh, press a button sometimes. Uh, so how I came to photography? Uh, <laughs> there is no romantic story behind that. Uh, while I was studying <laughs> in Greece, uh, I, <laughs> I did many jobs, uh, you know, to get some little money. And one of them was a photographer. So the, the work of photographer. And then I realized that it's something more than the work for me. I really loved it. Mm -hmm. So um, step by step, then I found myself into photography. Well, yes. I mean, I, that, I mean, I think that's almost universal that you, you know, you pick up a camera and decide that you actually 
really love you know what you can do with it. Um, so will you continue with this? Is this part? Well, tell us. Sorry, go ahead. No, at the beginning, uh, to be honest, of course, it's it's um, the photography that that I really like, taking pictures and and, mm -hmm. and uh, expressing and this dialogue and all these things. And then, but I realized that I really like the life of a photographer. You know, it's amazing to be a photographer. You have the best excuse to meet people. Yeah. And everybody is somehow accepting you. Yes. And yes. this is for me amazing. I I really enjoy that. Yeah, it gives you license. It sort of, um, you know, you, it gives you a, a key to a lot of doors you you wouldn't be able to necessarily get through, you know, if you were just, you know, knocking on your own. Yeah. Exactly. Um, exactly. exactly. What do you think you'd be doing next? Do you think you continue with this? I mean, that this looks like you could continue with it. I mean, there are these vignettes of you know individuals, you know, and uh, rather. Mm -hmm bleak you know uh, environments to be honest i had this idea to go back and to see how they will continue their lives uh mm -hmm. these three families that i met and also other but then came corona so it was almost right. impossible for me to right. go of course. There. Yeah. so now uh to be honest after seven years in germany um, I want a break from Germany, so I came back to Albania. I'm now based, based mostly in Tirana. And as I said, I left this country when I was six years old, and now I'm coming back to see what's going on with this country. After so many years, I mm. have many questions, and I think I will find some answers. Oh. <laughs> Hopefully, you bring your camera along on the journey. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's, it's beautiful work. It, it's you know, it, it's uh, understated. It was um, it was a soft approach, um, uh, a quiet approach, for quiet scenes as well. Although I imagine that the smelt wasn't that quiet, but there's an overall calm to it, which unusual in that kind of you know uh, uh, photojournalism. Um, it was great, very different than all three of you. You know, the, the three different you know uh, series we looked at were all quite different. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, Bertha, welcome back. Are, are, are Tom and Felix still with us, or have they departed? They okay? Uh, yeah, no, it, it's just it's just the three of us now. Uh, Thomas and Felix had to go, I gather. Um, well, I mean, I, you know, so I'd ask you, I mean, first, I mean, looking at the two of your works, um, you know, you're, you're really, you know, more like in, literally in the street and, and in the crisis. Um, um, it's a very different approach. Um, how do you, I, I mean, just, I'm, I'm trying to get a dialogue sort of between the two of you. You're both dealing with humanity and humanity in crisis, but it, it, they're very different imageries and they're very different situations. Yeah, so it's, it's quite, yeah, at that moment, I didn't think too much. I just want to capture everything. Like I didn't right. think of like what I should take or what I shouldn't, but I just want to like try to take as many pictures as I can because it's kind of like a historical moment, like a big thing in Hong Kong in, recent decade so so i just want to record everything and didn't think too much about that well true i mean it's very different in the sense that you're dealing with tumultuous events on the streets and it, you know i was dealing with much more um just quiet survival um but i you know it, it, when people talk about photojournalism they tend to sort of just throw a blanket over you know a, a broad idea of social documentary and uh, documentation and this you know i think the two of your work shows just how broad that can be and as well with thomas and felix um I, they're not here to, to uh answer us but how do the two of you feel about the the constructive nature of their work uh, particularly using artificial light mm. To be honest, uh, I like it. 
I like this this approach. It, it gives uh, another aesthetic on the on the picture, another feeling. Absolutely, and um, it's it's a stage. I don't know if if uh, you maybe know Alex Maioli, uh, the magnet photographer, and his last work is called yes. Scene, uh, Scena, no, and. Um, He's using uh, on black white, of course, photography, but he's using also light. And I really like his approach uh, that we, when when it's light there, you know, people are playing some roles or they're getting in a role. Or you can see it as it's on the stage, on the theatrical stage, mm -hmm. because of using light. Yes. And I've seen that the last years is, is taking more space using using the light uh, for, for sure in germany i've seen that for other colleagues and i really like it and it gives i think to documentary photography or photojournalism it's mostly documentary photography uh, another another approach it's, it's i can say like a river and now this is uh, something uh, right new direction. The river is changing course yeah. yeah well it is i mean you know obviously uh photojournalists were using, you know, uh, flash strobe um, since the beginning. Um, but it's different because it does add a narrative aspect to it. Um, you know, it's not just having an on-camera strobe to fill in a little bit of light because it would be too dark to take a picture if you, if you didn't have it. Um, it adds a theatrical element to it. Um, but I, I think, well, I mean, Anytime, if you're there and if you're you know close enough to engage those people, you're changing the, the scene. You know, you're involving yourself in the scene. You know, it may not be apparent in the photograph when you look at it, but if you're engaging those people, you, you have an effect on what you're reporting. Mm. I, I mean, I, I, I like it too. I, I mean, it's something that you. Uh, it does change how you see the image, don't you think? It changes how you think about it, respond to it. Yeah, that's a question. It wasn't a statement. Yeah, it's it's also it's also exactly a question because uh, Berta said before, and I really like that. Uh, this also how I see photography. Sometimes you don't think it's irrational. Photography, in my opinion, it's you don't think too much. You see something, it comes, bam, you shoot. Right. Yeah. When you have all this technical part, I think you are you get also in mode of of a director mm. because yeah. the light is there uh, i have yeah. to position myself here you know what i mean you cannot be rational uh, and and seeing taking pictures shooting a picture and then continuing you know so i think is 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 giving another another level of of uh, uh, acting as a photographer on the field I think they have like, yeah. I think they have a mind, uh, like picture, like what's they're going to narrate about mm -hmm. the situations. Like it's a COVID, it's a big topic, so they know that what's um, they're going to shoot, so they can um, stage uh, some of the pictures. Uh, I think it's kind of so. It's an as like as you mentioned, like it's another level of like documentary as well. It's like document like what's going on as well but it's kind of like a bigger pictures and bigger topic so it's not like the protest it's just like one moment that's it if it's gone the moment is gone so so i think it's quite a different uh scenario but at the same time it's also it's like a documentary as well it is i mean i, I think it's very interesting i mean I, I i'm asking questions i don't really feel i have any answers to it but I mean, it, it's not as if they, you know, created the a false, um, you know, no, crisis. Yeah. All the people, they're, they're real people. I mean, those yeah. are real locations. You know, that's yeah. what they're doing. You know, it's yeah. just the dialogue between the photographer and the subject matter. It's you know, mm -hmm. you can hear their voices, you know, more mm -hmm. clearly, you know, than you can. I mean, God, there's endless stories about how photojournalists, you know, created something that was actually, you know, presented as being just a, you know, a, they, they were uninvolved, you know, and they were simply there, you know, as a fly on the wall, but indeed, it actually was anything but that. 
I, I, you know, I find it refreshing that they don't pretend that they're not involved in themselves. You know, they're making it quite, you know, visually apparent that they are. Um, I mean, it, you know, it, 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 it's what makes it, photography to me so endlessly interesting. You know, it, it's, you know, you, they're, well, like anything, I mean, they're, you know, the permutations are infinite, you know, I mean, that's, that's how we all continue to find our voices. There's still room to create a voice. You know? mm. Completely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure, Laura, how are we doing on time? Forgive me. Laura? I think we're, are we, we're almost done, are we not? Well, I, I mean, let me just, I'll throw the ball completely back to you. Anything you'd like to conclude with? Anything you'd like to uh, say before we uh, sign off for the evening? Again, that's a question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, you know, I mean, does the, you know, just putting yourself in this arena with other photographers work, um, give you a little different perspective on your own work? Yeah. So like, based on the topic of fear is like, it can be so wide range and variety of different themes of work that can represent um, the theme fear is like, no matter it's like a violent situation, like in the protests or even in COVID, like you can see many people are like the bra bravery of of the rest of the world, like how people deal with the cri different crises. So it's quite amazing to meet up with and see a lot of great world in this photo festival. And thank you for arranging the talks that we can share our views and 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 talk <coughs> with you. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, I think it's I think it's wonderful. I'm, I mean, I'm, you know, I've certainly enjoyed being here uh, and doing it. Um, and it, this was a particularly interesting program because I, yeah. I'm not a photojournalist, and, it, and so I sort of have a little distance from you all. Um, mm -hmm. Well, um, I think on that, then I will will conclude it, and we'll say thank you both, and thank you to Thomas thank and Felix who are no longer with us. Um, but it was great work, and it was really. Uh, it, it, it's always I find very interesting to, to see the work, and then you know, hear, hear you know, hear from the photographer. So thank you both very much. Thank you, God. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. See you again. I hope. Thank you for the festival for everything, and continue like this. So yeah, it's a great, great thing that we're doing. Yeah. Well, great okay. to meet you both. <laughs> <laughs>